<laughs> then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came to attend him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may have given up something for that, and it's really not until you do that until you, that you begin to appreciate the strength of temptation. Because as soon as you decide you're not going to have it, that's all you can think about, right? <laughs> all you see, no matter where you go, it takes a lot of energy and effort to withstand temptation. And even people who have a tremendous amount of willpower always have an Achilles heel of some sort. There's always something where their, where their weakness shows its ugly head. <laughs> Nobody's exempt, not even Jesus, of being tempted. Well, Catholic Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, you're not tempted because you're evil. You're tempted because you're human. Temptation is something that God allows in our lives in order to test our faith and to strengthen and build our character. And it's important that we understand that the temptation itself is not sin. It's not sinful to be tempted. It's what we do that follows. It's the action we take after the temptation that determines whether or not it's sin. Today's lesson, we get two stories of temptation. Adam and Eve in the garden and Jesus in the desert. And it's interesting if you look at these two side by side and kind of compare and look where Adam and Eve failed and yet look where Jesus overcame. So let's turn to Genesis. It's going to be easy to find. We don't need a page number this morning. <laughs> turn to the beginning. But I want to start in chapter 2. So if there's a Bible close by, grab one. And we find Adam and Eve in, in a garden, the Garden of Eden. It's, it's synonymous with paradise. Um, so you just imagine this beautiful, lush rainforest of every, every green plant and every blooming flower. And everything they could have possibly wanted, right there, just for the taking. There was only one restriction, one line, that they weren't supposed to cross. Look at verse 16 in chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. One commandment, one rule, that's it. Don't do this. Everything else is up for grabs. Well, something I'd really never noticed before was the location of that tree. If you look up to verse 9 in chapter 2, it says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for fruit. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we're given the location, which is kind of interesting. We aren't told where any of the other things are, but we are told where this particular tree is. And it's interesting that it would be in the middle. It would be a central location. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called Creation and Fall, and he wrestled with this, this fact of information, and he said the reason he believes that the tree was placed in the center of the garden is because that's the place that God belongs, is in the center of our life. So how appropriate that that first temptation would occur in a central place, a place to disobey God 
a place to question God's love and goodness and word would be in the center. Only God belongs in the center. He's the one who defines good and evil. And it's according to his infinite wisdom, his infinite wisdom, no matter how much wisdom we think we might have, God's is greater. The, not, the idea of having knowledge of good and evil is very enticing. We want to know how to choose and have that power of knowledge. But God alone is the only one equipped to make those decisions. And he calls us into relationship on his terms, not on our own. So now let's look over to chapter 3, where everything starts to fall apart. We have this beautiful, perfect place, and it doesn't stay perfect too long. Temptation came in the form of a serpent, which we're told is one of God's creatures. And we know from the rest of scripture that Satan is often depicted as a serpent or a dragon. And so Satan is, influ is using this serpent being to influence the situation. And Satan, of course, is also one of God's creatures, one of his fallen angels. Um, he asks Eve, did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? He gets her to question what God has told Adam and Eve. And Eve responds with God's own words. And the only problem is she didn't get it right. She misquotes him. In fact, she made some pretty serious errors into the original wording. Her version's in Genesis 3.2. She says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, or you will die. Two big errors she made. The first one is she dropped the words free and any. God had said you're free to eat from any tree except the one. She dropped those two words, and so in a sense she's minimizing God's provision. And it's, that's, that's the way it is. You know, as soon as we start focusing on a restriction, something we can't have. We start, we start minimizing what we do have. Yeah, this is nice, but it's not that. You know? Yeah, this is really pleasant, but it's not as nice as that would be. It's a very common tem temptation that we have to start minimizing. Secondly, she added to God's word. God never said anything about touching the tree, and yet she added that restriction. She's increasing God's demands beyond what he himself has set, seeming, making him seem more severe than he really is. Now I want you to look at verse 4. Satan boldly denies God's word. Satan said in verse 4, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He points out that it's not just food God's denying them. Is it denying them the opportunity to be like him, to know good and evil. So she and Adam both ate from the tree. Dialogue's all going on with Eve, but we're told that Adam was with her. So he must have been listening and, and, and not interjected in any way and partake, partook in the sin just as much as she did. They both chose to doubt God's word, and as a result, sin came into the world. Now let's compare it with Jesus. Jesus is sometimes called the second Adam. He's God's son, and he was placed to follow God's commandments. But he also had to succumb to, had to submit to temptation. But this time, he wasn't in a lush garden. He wasn't in a wonderful, lush, beautiful green place. He was in the desert, in the wilderness. And he didn't have any provision at all. We're told that he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So he was very, very hungry. Adam and Eve could have had anything to eat they wanted except for the one tree. But Jesus had no food, no shelter, nothing. And it was under these much harsher conditions that Satan came to tempt him. And again, he brought God's word into question. He said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now right before Jesus had gone out into the desert, he'd been baptized by John. And the Holy Spirit had come down on him and God had spoken from the clouds and said, this is my beloved son. He declared it. This is my son. Now Satan's trying to get into question. If you are the son of God. And just as he did with Adam and Eve, he again used his stomach as a target of temptation. Adam and Eve weren't particularly hungry, but Jesus sure was. He was human, remember? He must have been beyond hungry. The idea of having something to eat had to be pretty attractive. And he certainly could have pulled it off. We know that bread 
Miracles are in his repertoire. He did it many times. But like Eve, he responded with God's own words. But this time he got it right. He answered from the book of Deuteronomy. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yes, God's concerned about our physical needs, but even more important are our spiritual needs, our need for that relationship with God. Next, he takes him and sets Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple, a height of, we're told, of about 450 feet. And he challenges him to test God's word again. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will give his angels charge of you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so you will not strike your foot against the stone. But Jesus rejects trying to get God to perform on his behalf, trying to test his word to see whether or not it's true. He answers, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Finally, Jesus is shown all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan says, it's all yours. All you have to do is kneel down and worship me. He was offering Jesus what was already rightfully his. The word says that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and at his name every knee will bow. All those kingdoms are already his. But Satan was offering him a shortcut. He was offering him a chance to take what was rightfully his by bypassing the cross. Just kneel and worship me now. We won't have to go through all that Calvary mess. But this is where Satan went too far. He went too far because he dealt, first it was just Jesus' personal needs for food and protection, but now he was messing with his role, his purpose, his ministry. God's will for him was not to look for an easy way out, not to take a shortcut, but to take the long, hard road up to the cross. There would be no deal-making, no shortcuts. He was going to be obedient, even though he knew the suffering and the pain that would be involved. Jesus' temptation and victory over Satan in the desert shows us that he was fully human. He was just as subject to temptation and want and need as we are. And yet he's also fully God because he did not submit. He did not give in to the sin. It wasn't to prove to God that Jesus wouldn't sin. It was more to prove to the world and especially to Satan who he was and what he'd come to do, that he was the perfect son of God. Let me illustrate this point for you. The Union Pacific Railroad was being constructed a long time ago, and they made an elaborate trestle over this wide canyon in the west. And the builder wanted to test it. So he took a locomotive and added a, you know, a bunch of cars and increased the payload till he pretty much doubled the weight of the train. And he drove it out to the middle of the bridge and he left it all day long. Well, somebody said, are you trying to break this bridge? And the builder says, no, I'm trying to prove that it won't be broken. Jesus' temptation wasn't trying to break him. It was trying to prove to us and to everyone else he wouldn't be broken by temptation. Now, in both of these accounts, Satan attacked in areas of weakness, and he also attacked in the area of truth. He offered something that was desirous, and then he tried to get his victim to question the truth of God's word concerning it. And we find this in our own lives as well. Something we really want is dangled right in front of us. Something we think we need, perhaps, but with a shortcut. And we find ourselves questioning, is it really so terrible? Would the world come to a screeching halt if this one time I just, whatever? Or, okay, this is the last time and then I'll never do it again. <laughs> well, this morning we get two examples of how to respond in those situations. We can give in to our desires and doubts like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Or we can hold fast to the truth of God's word and his promises, just like Jesus did in the desert. But it's not always easy to do. Sometimes the consequences of resisting temptation can be pretty painful. Let me give you an example from my own experience. When I was 23 years old, I taught high school science. I taught biology and chemistry and physics at a small public rural school just for one year. And um, it was one of those small towns where everybody knows everybody. And since I wasn't from the small town, I was clearly the outsider. And I, you know, I was only 23. I really wanted to fit in. I wanted the teachers to like me. I wanted the students to like me. I just wanted to do a good job. Well, one of my physics students was the star football player. 
from this school that wasn't saying a whole lot. But he was the star football player, right? and he was a senior. And he wasn't very, doing very well in my class. I offered to stay late and give him some help. I gave the class extra credit projects, hoping he would take advantage of it. Um, nothing. He never, he never went beyond just showing up and, <coughs> I hope, doing his best. But unfortunately, for the grading period, right before homecoming, he got an F. He also got an F in English, and in that school's policy, if you had two Fs on your report card and you were a football player, you sat out the next grading period. You didn't get to play. Well, as soon as I turned in my grading report, um, the head coach was in my office. Do, his name was not Johnny, but we're going to call him Johnny. Do you realize that Johnny is, is a senior? This is going to be his last homecoming game, and we really need him. And I said, I know, I'm sorry, but this is what I offered him. This is what Johnny did. Well, next came some of the senior football players. Mrs. Pauline, oh my gosh, you've you got to let Johnny play. Well, we don't have a chance. This is our last homecoming game. we got to have him on the field. Sorry, guys, I can't do it. Then some of the teachers started showing up. <laughs> Kept wondering if they were coming to the English teacher who gave him the other F. But I suspected that they came to me. And um, finally, I looked at the headmistress and I said, I told her what had been going on. I said, am I being asked to change this young man's grade? And she said, I wouldn't want you to do anything you weren't comfortable with. I said, well, I'm glad you said that because I'm not comfortable with changing his grade. I'm sorry. And she just kind of said, okay, that's fine. So I called Johnny in and I explained to him. I reminded him all the times I offered to stay after and all the projects that he could have taken advantage of. And, and I told him I couldn't, I couldn't change his grade. It wasn't what he earned. It wasn't fair to him. It wasn't fair to the rest of the students. And that I said, I know you probably can't understand now, but I hope one day you will be able to. He didn't look like he was ever going to understand. That. <laughs> and I wish I could say, 10 years later, he came to my door, but he hasn't yet. Um, he was not happy with me. And the consequences for me holding my ground were incredibly unpleasant. I was the most hated teacher on campus. Um, the senior football players made my life very miserable for the rest of the six months of the school year. And um, I wasn't real popular in the teacher's lounge either. But I had to do what I knew was right. It would have been lying to change that young man's grade. And God has some really strong things to say about lying. And so I was forced to choose. Am I going <coughs> to do the thing that would make my life so nice? Or am I going to be true to, to what God expects of us, even though the consequences aren't very pleasant? Well... I've never forgotten how hard that year was. And I've, I've been healed of a lot of it, <laughs> thanks to prayer. But I've really never regretted it. And like I said, I still pray for Johnny and hope that he does someday understand what I was trying to do for him. Jesus wielded one, one weapon in the battle against Satan in the desert. And that was the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And he wielded it flawlessly. He knew the scriptures and he knew his father. We too have the same weapon when we're battling Satan. We have the words of the scriptures as well and we have God's own spirit within us. So you'll find that the more time you spend in God's word, the more time you spend reading the scriptures, the better equipped you're going to be to handle temptation. And you might say, well, I never remember anything I read. But you have the spirit within you and the spirit promised to bring the word to remembrance whenever we need it. And I, I would imagine some of you here have had that experience. In the middle of a really tough situation, all of a sudden a word of scripture comes to your mind, and you think, where did that come from? Well, sometime in your past, you had read it, and you'd stored it up just like an arsenal. All of God's words stored up within you so that the Holy Spirit could draw on it when you needed it. And when he does, you find the willpower that you need. You find the strength that you lack to turn and do the right thing. One last thing I want to note about these two stories before we finish is the words take and eat. Now the temptation in the garden led to the sinful act of disobedience when Adam and Eve took and eat the forbidden fruit. And in that act of disobedience, sin entered the world. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then their eyes, were, uh, both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Before it had been perfectly natural for them to be naked. But now all of a sudden it was a thing of shame. Their innocence had been lost. 
their eyes had been opened to the reality of sin and its consequences. Yet before Jesus went to the cross, he sat down at a table with his disciples and he took bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and said, Drink this, this is my blood of a new covenant, which will be for the forgiveness of many. And it's the life of Jesus that we take in when we take and eat at the table of the Lord. We're celebrating that forgiveness and the eternal life that we have in him. When Adam and Eve took and ate, it brought death and sin and brokenness and fallenness to the whole world. Jesus came to reverse that terrible curse, to take the punishment that we deserve upon himself on the cross, and to erase the debt that we owe God. When we take and eat, we're declaring this for ourselves, and we're taking Jesus within and taking him out into the world to share what we have found in him. So the choice is ours. By virtue of our humanity, we share Adam and Eve's sin. But also, because of our own actions, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us sits here innocent. Because of his sin and ours, we're under God's curse, and the penalty that's due us is death and separation from God. But Jesus came as the second Adam. He faced temptation and overcame it, and he was obedient, even to death on the cross, so that we would have the opportunity to be set free from those terrible consequences, that we could be forgiven of, and set free of sin's punishment and curse. <coughs> God has set before us two men, Adam and Jesus. We have to, each one of us to decide who we will identify with, and the consequences and results of that choice, of course, are eternal. Let's pray. Lord, it is hard to live according to your standards in this world, Lord. Everything seems to work against it. Temptations on every corner. But we also know that you are greater than anything we will ever face. So, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here this day who has not yet chosen between you and Adam, I pray that you would give them the grace to open their eyes and see the love that you have for us in Jesus, the forgiveness that is ours through faith. And Lord, for those of us who have made that choice, strengthen our resolve to do your will and to be obedient, to take your word and to store it up in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, as we come to your table in a few minutes to take and eat, let us remember and celebrate what we have in you. It's in your name alone we pray. Amen. Amen.